Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. I'm Vince, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm really glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Bob, and uh, whoever else is uh, responsible. I'm uh, just glad to be here in Las Vegas, uh, sober, uh, which is a, you know, I've been here before, often not sober, and uh, it's uh, it's good to be here, sober and comfortable and uh, living a good life. I. Uh, this is a privilege to get to do this, and I want to remember to say that because sometimes uh, I always want to remember that. It's not a chore, and it's not a burden. It's it's a privilege to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. And so uh, I had a great day today. Uh, I slept in until about 11 o'clock. My wife uh, got up and went to work very quietly, as well she should. And uh, for some reason, I suspect I may pay the price for that tomorrow morning early, but uh, I will. I was out late last night, and I'm here tonight, and it's, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, Minnie was great. Gee, what a great talk, huh? Yeah, give her a hand. Uh, and we have some new people who raised their hands earlier, and I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I want you to know that that's where you are tonight. Uh, you know, you're an AA, which is a dismal proposition, probably, if you're anything at all like I was. Uh, and if you are new or relatively new here tonight, although we, we may have ne- we never have met you, we know everything about you. And you may find that strange. But, for example, we know that... Uh, this has been a very bad year. <laughs> we also know that most probably, uh, you if we really were to get deep inside of your soul, we would discover that you secretly really believe that you're not quite like us <laughs> and that you don't really belong here and that your case is different, and that you are not really alcoholic. And we would like you to know that if you feel that way, the very fact that you feel that way means that you are precisely like us. That is almost the requirement for membership in Alcoholics Anonymous, is to be utterly convinced that you are in the wrong place and that you don't belong. It certainly was the case with me. And that, and I will tell you tonight about my first AA meeting, which was a long time ago. It was in November of 1965. I know, girls. I do not look that old. I understand. I was only seven at that meeting. But it was in the basement of a Presbyterian church in Long Beach, California, on a very rainy night in November of 1965. And I, uh, it was a, uh, a, a really great meeting. It's much like this meeting, and, and I want to tell you something. You know, there are certain places you go in AA, or certain meetings that you can walk into, and you know that it's going on. You know what I mean? All you need to do is be in the room, and there's an, a certain electricity, or there's a certain thing that happens here that you know you're connecting with. It's it's re- and tonight, and you have it here. Uh, you had it even before Minnie got up to talk, and and I could feel it, and I know that this is real. And that meeting that night that I went to, that first night in Long Beach, that was real, too. It was a very big speaker meeting, much like this. It was dynamic, and it was exciting, and it was upbeat. And the people there all looked good, and they sounded good, and they smelled good. And nobody looked as though they were an alcoholic. They did not look like what I perceived an alcoholic to look like. Nobody there. They were nice people. And it was uh, the men wore coats and ties, and the ladies wore dresses a long time ago. It was in... uh, you must remember, it wasn't an AA meeting on every corner 24 hours a day then. Uh, and it was this was the big event in Long Beach. Everybody went to this meeting on Friday night. And boy, it was a big deal. 
And uh, if you were to wander into that room on, on that Friday night and you were to look around and someone were to say to you, you are in a room filled with alcoholics, pick them out. You wouldn't pick, pick anybody out, except maybe me. Uh, I had on a dirty T-shirt and a ripped pair of jeans. I had not shaved or bathed in over a week. And I had spent the previous five bit days in the Long Beach City Jail. Due to a series of unfortunate circumstances that were clearly not my fault. The, uh, <laughs> turns out that the police department in Long Beach is fascist. And they had abused my civil rights uh, on a regular basis in those days. And I ended up in the Long Beach City Jail, and this was the latest of those occasions. And I ended up in the basement of this Presbyterian church. And I also should tell you that I'm Irish, and I'm Catholic, and I'm from New Jersey. And I like you are, and, and, uh, and I have a, a great deal of difficulty with people from Texas. Uh, you know, we have a chemistry problem. You know, some, and I sat next to this guy who was about six foot five, and he had a cowboy hat in his lap, and his name was Tex. And Tex wanted to hit me. And he told me, he said, boy, I'm going to hit you. And I remember thinking, oh, Jesus, you know, go hit somebody else, Tex, you know, leave me alone. But he was going to hit me. And the first thing he did was he repeated to me in rapid succession all of the AA cliches, one after another. And they are dreary, aren't they? I mean, really grim. I mean, good God. Easy does what? You know. And he, he finally put his arm around my shoulder and he said, ah, keep it simple. I thought, I'll bet you do, Tex. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely no quarrel with that, I will tell you. And he gave me a handful of pamphlets, and on top of the handful of pamphlets was a card with the 20 questions on it, which uh, we give to you if you're new. Uh, the medical school at Johns Hopkins has decided that they can determine how alcoholic we are by the way we answer these questions. And that may or may not be true. I, I don't know whether it is or not. It's, I can tell you one thing, it's irrelevant. It's meaningless to you. But uh, if, if, on the other hand, if some old timer asks you to take this test, do it. It will please them. And they will treat you better. So it's a good idea to do it. But the criteria for this test is if you answer these questions affirmatively, the more yes answers you have as you go down this column, the more alcoholic you get. But it's, just, it's that simple. So, uh, if you answer one question, yes, you, you may have a drinking problem. If you answer two questions, yes, you certainly have a drinking problem, and three or more, and you are an alcoholic. Not a lot of wiggle room there, I'll tell you. you know. And I took this test for text, and I answered about 15 or 16 of these questions, yes. I remember I answered no to the question, do you seek lower companions, uh, you know. I could not find any, you know. <laughs> Where the hell do you go after the Long Beach City Jail? It was, you know, ridiculous, superfluous. And the meeting began, and it began precisely the way we began here this evening. They read essentially what is our program. And if you are new or relatively new and you wonder what it is we have, that's what we have. And if you are to recover here, you must take these 12 steps. There, there's no ambiguity. You must take them. They are required. They are mandatory. They are not merely suggested. That is a lie. You must do it. If you do it, you recover. If you do not do it, you do not recover. And you sit in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous unrecovered. And you can do that for a very long time. And I will tell you from personal experience, it is a horrible existence. I don't know of a more miserable way to live. And it can happen here. And in a room this big, there's people here tonight doing that. You've been here some appreciable length of time. You have not taken these steps. You are not getting any better. And you know it. And I'll tell you another secret. So does everybody else. <laughs> and the way that you really know it is you are surrounded by people who are getting better. 
and you know it's real, and you know they're getting better, and you know you're not, and you know they're not phony, and you know everything about them is real, and it is frustrating because you, you wish they weren't, don't you? you? You wish they were phonies, but you know they're not because something happens to people who get better here. That is, you can't fake it. It is transforming. People, their eyes change. Their, their appearance change. Their, they have a sense of purpose. They have direction. They're going somewhere. And if you're a loser like me, and you sit here, and you look at them, and you think to yourself, when does that happen to me? When do I get to feel like that? I mean, do they have secret meetings? Yeah. Were they really... Yeah, I, intellectually, that's ridiculous, but psychologically, I think I believe that. That's that's the way that I operated for a long time. Now, I sat in that first meeting, and I heard those 12 steps read, and I don't know about you, but I didn't hear anything new. I'm the end product of eight years of Dominican nuns and four years of Jesuit priests. And I'm going to tell you, none of this is new. There is not an original idea in any of this. I know all about these principles. I live within the framework of that ethic. All my life, it is. We call a lot of these things by different names, but they're precisely this, a searching and fearless moral inventory. In my religious tradition, is called examination of conscience. It is precisely the same exercise, admitting to God and to another human being the exact nature of your wrongs. We Catholic boys know how to do that well. Every Saturday afternoon, from the time you're seven years old to the time you're we know about that. And if there's one thing I know about all of this, it has absolutely nothing to do with the way that I drink. Because if it did, I certainly would not have to come to a Presbyterian church on a Friday night, I will tell you. As a matter of fact, if you listen to this stuff, it's rather broad brush. It is really pretty superficial. I mean, you know, really. Uh, I don't need to hear you read this this superficial drivel to me. I mean, I can tell you, I've read Aquinas. I can prove to you that there is a God. I can, I can tell you about apologetics. I know all about all of that. So I sat in the back of that room, and I listened to this, and somewhere in my subconscious, I dismissed it. I said, that doesn't apply to me. My case is different. And the meeting continued, and there were several people who participated. They were nice people. And I don't remember what they said, but they were innocuous things that were inapplicable to me. I remember that they seemed to be nice people who drank too much, came to the Presbyterian church on Friday night, quit drinking, and went immediately back to being nice people. So I said to Tex, where do you send the more difficult cases? You know, is, that a, is something more wrong with it? And he said, shut up, or something equally as articulate. And... If I had any doubts as they were blowing there or not, they, they were cured at the end of the meeting when they had birthdays. I mean, really, good God. Birthday parties for middle-aged people who didn't have a drink for a year. And they would sing happy birthday to them, and they would blow out candles on a cake. I mean, it was really, it's, it was like something that should take place in a mental institution. Is it really... Uh, <laughs> in the day room, you know, right before dance therapy. Uh, yeah. After you've been down to work on your ashtray, you know, you come up and have birthday parties for the alcoholics. And they had several of these imbecilic uh, celebrations. And one in particular, so a woman is about 110, and she was sober forever, so had a fire on top of this cake. And she came down the aisle, and she blew the candles out, and she got up here, and she said her name was Phoebe and that she was an alcoholic. And then she said something about, did I want what she had? Not tonight, Phoebe, i got to tell you. I don't think so. Now, that was my first AA meeting. And I'll tell you one thing for sure, Minnie, it was not my moment. I promise you that. But I'll tell you what I did. For the next three and one half years, I stayed sober in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I stayed, I didn't drink any alcohol. I used no mood altering chemicals whatsoever. And I was as physically sober then as I am tonight. 
And during that period of time, I did everything there was to do in AA. I participated in Alcoholics Anonymous on every level. I set up chairs, I washed cups, I cleaned ashtrays, I shared meetings, I spoke to young people. I did everything there was to do in AA except one thing. I did not take these steps. And as a result, my alcoholism got worse. And it got worse while I stayed sober in the middle of AA. Now, on the outside, wonderful things happened to me. I got a fantastic job. I should tell you, I come from a wonderful family. There's uh, a huge Irish Catholic family in New Jersey with no other alcoholics in it, which is rank heresy in AA, isn't it? I mean, really. But they're not. There's nothing wrong with any of them. They are loving and successful and 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 kind and bright. And, and I am the fifth child in a family of five kids. I have four older sisters. And my youngest sister is 11 years older than I am. And my father was 50 and my mother was 45 when I was born. And along came this boy in this big Irish family with all these girls. I want to tell you, the prince had arrived. My sisters just, I mean, they just, they fought over who was going to get to babysit me. It was during the war, and they dressed me in sailor suits and soldier suits, and I have pictures saluting the flag, and, you know, I mean, it's just nauseating, would make you throw up. <laughs> but that's the way I was raised. Uh, uh, my father uh, adored me. My father just, he loved me so much. He, I, I, I don't think he said a crossword to me till the day he died. He was so delighted that he had a son after all this time, at that time in his life. And so uh, my earliest recollections of Christmas are, are my father in my bedroom in the middle of the night waking me up saying things like, I just saw the sleigh leave. Let's go downstairs. And the entire family would get up and go downstairs and celebrate Christmas at 3 o'clock in the morning. Because my father couldn't wait. <laughs> so I was loved. I was not abused. My alcoholism is not my family's fault. I also should tell you I am the product of the Roman Catholic Church. You can't get much more of a product of the Roman Catholic Church than me. And I will also tell you something about that. I was not tortured by evil nuns nor warped by bad priests, nor given a, a belief in a God that I don't know who heard all of this stuff or where they got it from. I didn't hear it. My experience with Roman Catholic nuns was, was that they were wonderful women who took people like me who were behavior problems and educated us. And it was not an easy task. 60-year-old uh, women with cancer who coached basketball teams. And I think they get bad rap in Alcoholics Anonymous. So if you're going to trash nuns, don't do it around me. Uh, and I'll tell you something else. My alcoholism is not the fault of the Roman Catholic Church. Yours isn't either, incidentally, if you're still trying to hang it on them. I have a bulletin from the Vatican. They are not accepting responsibility. You will make a startling discovery here when you write that searching and fearless moral inventory as you must do if you're going to survive here. Man, it's the worst news I ever got in my life. My life is my fault. Not the news I wanted, I will tell you. It may not be therapy, but it's AA. Now, I should also tell you that my parents died within one week of each other when I was 12 years old. My father had a coronary and dropped dead on January the 3rd, 1953. And my mother, who had congestive heart failure for many years before that, she just kind of quit and couldn't go on. And she died a week later. And we had these two big funerals in the space of two weeks. And it was a traumatic thing for a 12-year-old kid. There's no question about that. But we were this, this wonderful family. And we were after My father had been vice president of the railroad. There was money. There was, you know, a, a privilege. Uh, there was not. And I, these wonderful sisters of mine had all 
finished college and married great men and, you know, this wonderful family. And uh, I ended up, however, going to live with an uncle, a bachelor uncle, my mother's brother, who was 65 years old. And I was 12. Now, you might find that odd. But the reason that that happened is my uncle was more or less the patriarch of our family, and he was a very powerful man. He was a politician in the state of New Jersey, and he was a mayor of Jersey City for 27 consecutive years, uh, and state chairman of the Democratic Party, and he was an old-world, quintessential Irish politician bachelor. He went to Mass and Communion every day of his life. He never married, and he, he uh, decided I should go live with him, and he was going to undertake my education and see to it that uh, I was taken care of. So I went to live with my uncle, and he was an old-world man. He was a, you know, he wore, I never saw him dressed in anything but a pinstripe suit and a white shirt and a tie. I mean, that's, on Saturday mornings, that's how he dressed, you know. I mean, it's just, it was just a, and we had this communications problem, as you might imagine, he and I. Uh, we ate dinner at opposite ends of a long dining room table every night in coats and ties and discussed politics. That's what we did. That was the mother's milk of our family, and that's what we did. And uh, that's how I grew up. Now, I began to become a problem in school. Now, I'm a good student. I get A's. I always get A's in everything. But I am what is known as a behavior problem. I get in a lot of trouble. And by now, it has something to do with alcohol. I can't remember when my first drink was. But I went to a lot of prep school. I went to four different prep schools with a lot of Irish Catholic boys. Everybody drank. That's what we did. We drank. <clears throat> Nobody used drugs, but we drank. And we drank a lot. And we were all smart. And we all got good grades. But we all got in a lot of trouble. And I got in more trouble than they did. I went to four different Jesuit prep schools. And the reason I went to four is I was thrown out of the one I was in every year for drinking or something connected to drinking, some kind of behavior. At my senior year in high school, I was the valedictorian of my class. I was due to give the address at graduation, except I, that didn't happen because I did not even get to attend graduation because I got drunk and stole this priest's car and went joyriding. And they told me, don't come to graduation. Just don't even. And if we ever have a reunion, don't come to that either. And just don't come back. And so I graduated from high school and I went on to uh, college uh, in upstate New York, uh, one of the very best schools in the country, a great school, and I, my undergraduate experience was uh, blackout drinking, and I can't tell you much about undergrad school, except that uh, uh, I was uh, in a lot of trouble all the time. I was the kind of guy that when we drank at fraternity parties, they, I was, uh, you left me alone eventually. I ended up alone. You did not want to be around me because my behavior was so bad in so many different ways. Uh, I, I came out of blackouts and uh, cars stranded in snowbanks in the middle of February in Ithaca, New York, which is a chilly, I will tell you. I've had, I had the fire rescue squad come and get me out of a car when I, I came out of a blackout one night in a sorority house uh, in this young lady's bedroom in the bed with the house mother standing over the end of the bed with a, just a hideous, and she, she said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I, I don't know. I, I, I think she needed to be tutored. But, and that's the way I went to undergrad school. And in the middle of my senior year, I got in an argument with my uncle over money. And uh, I showed him who was going to be captain of my ship. And it certainly was not going to be him. So I quit school and joined the Navy as an enlisted man. Now, get this. I left an Ivy League university in the middle of my senior year with a 3.8 GPA in biochemistry to join the Navy as an enlisted man. I was a bright kid. And I ended up, uh, I was going to have a medical career. I was on track to go to med school. And uh, so they made me a Navy corpsman, uh, a hospital corpsman in the Navy. And uh, they sent me through basic hospital corps school, and I did very well. And then they sent me to a more advanced medical school where they trained corpsmen to go on destroyers so they don't have physicians. Medical training is more sophisticated. Did well there. Then medical administration school, did very well in that. And they commissioned me an officer. They made me an ensign. And they uh, sent me overseas and attached me to the 3rd Marine Division on Okinawa, which was a, not in my grand plan, I will tell you, but I, 
I arrived in Okinawa attached as a medical administrative officer to the 3rd Marine Division, and they couldn't decide what the hell to do with me. They didn't have a job for me, so they put me in an officer's club at the northern end of Okinawa and forgot about me. And I forgot about them, quite frankly. It was a mutual... Uh, what I did was I got up every day and reported to the cocktail lounge of this officer's club and drank Hag and Hag Pinch at 60 cents a pop, which was not bad, I'll tell you. It was a, and that's what I did, and nobody bothered me. And pretty soon they put another guy up there. He was a surgeon out of Temple University, and uh, he was a very bad drunk, and they didn't want him around patients. So they put him up in this officer's club, and he and I bonded. We became brothers, and... Uh, we, uh, nobody bothered us, and they left us alone, and we uh, kind of forgot we were in the military after a while. We, we grew beards and wore shorts, and uh, at one point had lost all our uniforms. Couldn't figure out where the hell they were. All we did was get up and go drink in the officer's club, and at night we would go out and drink in the bars in the villages. And it was just really, uh, uh, we became quite renowned in the villages of, of Okinawa. We practiced medicine at night for them for free, and, uh, you know, we really did. We were really uh, like folk heroes on the island of Okinawa until... The regimental commander of the 5th Marines, this bird colonel, had a dinner party, and all officers in his command had to attend. So we had to shave, uh, find some uniforms, and go to the colonel's party. And when we arrived and we sat down to dinner, the colonel looked around, and he looked at us, and he said, who the hell are they? He said, here were two officers in his command who he had never met. And he said, who are they? And somebody said, well, the one guy's a doctor. I don't know who the hell the other guy is. And... Uh, he said, give them a job. So they had to give us a job. So they put us in charge of venereal disease control for the island of Okinawa. And what that job consisted of is uh, the Marines would get gonorrhea and syphilis and lymph granuloma. They would get hideous venereal disease. Today you call them STDs. In those days we called them venereal disease. Far more unpleasant name, I, I think. And uh, the Marines would catch... Uh, bacteria, bugs that you only saw in textbooks, and in Marines. I think the only two places they ever existed. And our job was to go out into the villages and, and find the young ladies in question and uh, make sure that they did not continue to spread the good news. And so we had this awesome power to quarantine these bars. So we would ride around Okinawa in a Jeep from bar to bar, and they knew that we could quarantine them, so they would set up the good scotch. So we drank uh, all over Okinawa for free every day, and we never quarantined one bar, uh, I'm proud to say. And so it was an interesting uh, tour of duty. Uh, you didn't want to drink too much in these bars, however. You don't want the girls to start looking good to you. Uh, you knew why you were there. You know, so not a, so we need, we were kind of a, you, you walk a fine line. And eventually our uh, tour of duty uh, was up and we went back to the United States and uh, we mustered out of the military and he went back to a temple and he finishes his residency in thoracic surgery. And today he is a cardiovascular surgeon in Philadelphia. And as far as I know, he's yet to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. And the moral to that story is if you need a bypass, stay the hell out of Philadelphia, I suppose. <laughs> I went back up to Cornell and I finished my uh, undergraduate uh, the last semester and got my undergraduate degree and got tentatively accepted at a couple of medical schools with the proviso that I had social problems and that I wasn't quite ready to go to medical school and I should go out in the world and work for a year or so. And so I did. I've not yet been back, so I suppose I... But I left uh, Ithaca, New York, and I did what most of you did when that, you reached that time in your life when you knew there was something really wrong with you, but you didn't know what it was, and you certainly was not, were not ready to label it as alcoholism. Do you remember that? You knew that your peers, something was happening for them that was not happening for you. They were socializing. They were completing their education, beginning careers, uh, marrying, starting families, and you seemed stuck. Do you remember that? You were stuck. You didn't know. You knew that you were not mature as they were. And you didn't really know why. And the remedy for that is to get married immediately. And that's what I did. I married a gal that I knew in the Navy. She was a Navy nurse. And we got married. She got pregnant immediately. And we moved to Southern California. And I applied to SC to go to medical school. And I got accepted. And uh, the summer before school, 
I needed a stopgap job. We moved in with her parents, pregnant wife, brand new in-laws, and I got a job for the summer as a bartender. Now, that did not work out well. Uh, I, the, I would end up coming home at 4 o'clock in the morning in various states of undress with the drunk. And uh, a month later, the marriage dissolved, it broke up, and the, they threw me out. And I found myself on Bosa Avenue in Santa Ana, Orange County, with a lot of uh, Samsonite luggage and no money. And for the rest of the summer, I got a job as an ambulance driver. Now, I'm a blackout drinker. So some of the ambulance calls were colorful, I will tell you. Uh, I've been on ambulance calls, and I've come out of a blackout with the lights and the siren going. And I've had to turn to the attendant next to me and say, uh, where are we going? You know, which would unnerve him, I will tell you. One night, we got stuck going around a circle in a cul-de-sac in uh, Newport Beach. You know how you lock on to something and you just can't? And this ambulance very slowly going around this cul-de-sac in Newport Beach with the beacon light going on up top, shining through these people's bedroom windows. They're all coming out on their porch in their pajamas, watching this ambulance slowly go around this cul-de-sac. And they sent a police car in to lead me out of the cul-de-sac, which is humiliating. And I lost my job as a result of that. And I also lost my driver's license in the state of California. And I also lost my acceptance to medical school, which was really happened all in one fell swoop. That's the package that I brought to Alcoholics Anonymous. That's who I was. And when I got sober, a new profession had opened up in civilian medicine in the late 60s. It was called the Physician's Assistant Program. And many of you know what that is now today, but in those days it was brand new. It was a brand new concept in civilian medicine. And the reason for it was that most of these guys getting out of the medical schools were all taking residencies and going in specialties, and there weren't enough guys doing primary care medicine in the emergency room. So they took us, who had this sophisticated medical training in the military, and we became the first PAs. And I was the third licensed PA in the state of California, and I went to work nights in an emergency room in East L.A. I don't know if you know anything about East L.A., but it's really a, quite a place at night especially in the emergency room. And we had the county contracts, so we got the shootings and the stabbings, and, the, and we had the, and, and all of the industrial trauma from the places like Kaiser Steel. And so anyway, it was an exciting uh, job. And I did it very well. I was well-trained, quite frankly, and I was successful at what I did. I was well-paid. I made a lot of money. I was in on the ground floor of a new profession. I had newfound sobriety in Alcoholics Anonymous. I met a beautiful girl, a daughter of a longtime sober AA member. We fell in love. She got, we got married. She went to Al-Anon. We were just too precious is what we were, I'll see. And I would not be up to the task. And I have no spiritual program. I did not take these steps. And, but I have a wonderful medical education. So I know how to take care of depression. I use Dexedrine. 15 milligram spantules. And by the time I was through with those, I was taking six or seven of them a day. Now, I don't know if you know anything about amphetamine abuse, but that will move you right on down the road. Let me tell you, boy, I'll... whatever you're doing, you will do it in a hurry. The problem with that, along about the fourth or fifth day when you've not slept nor eaten, and your hair stands right out on end like that, boy, and your eyes dilate over here like this, and I used to get this white crud that would come down right here like this, and I'd, I'd show up in the emergency room to help the sick. And the problem with that, the guy you're relieving never wants to go home. You know, They're always saying things to you like, Vince, you need sleep. Get something to eat. And thank God for medical science, because there's an anecdote for that. And that is a drug called Demerol. Oh, I can see we have a lot of Demerol people here. Huh? Do you all know about Demerol? Demerol is a narcotic. Demerol is not a narcotic. I bet you this. Is, I bet you didn't know that. It's a synthetic. Don't worry about it. You'd never know the difference. You, you know, <laughs> purely academic, but it is a synthetic. And, so, and we're going to. This is Alcoholics Anonymous, so I'm going to talk about this. This is. We need to say this. Narcotic addiction and alcoholism are different. They are not the same thing. And don't let anyone tell you that they are. They're not. 
narcotics uh, come from opium, all of them. And they're all essentially the same drug. Morphine, dilaudid, heroin, same thing. All comes to the same place. And, uh, and they all have one thing in common. They're addictive. They're addictive physiologically and psychologically for everyone. You don't need to even have an addictive personality. You just need a syringe and a needle. And you inject heroin intravenously or more, you'll get addicted. I promise you. That is not true with alcohol. Turns out that about 9 out of 10 people who drink alcohol do it with impunity. They're not alcoholics. They don't wreck cars. They don't destroy families. They don't ever come to AA. They are social drinkers and they spend their entire lives like that. Now, I don't understand them. They say things that are baffling. Like, no more for me. I have to drive. Okay? Or I'd love to have another, but my wife's waiting dinner. Really? I'm going home. Yeah? I'm going to Las Vegas. That's where you're going. Obviously, you're here. And, that, you know, that's, but that's the way that nine out of ten people who drink alcohol, that's the way they drink. And they, now, I have never met a social heroin user. So the dynamic is different. It's not the same. Uh, I personally believe, just a personal opinion, I think people drink alcohol, alcoholics, not people, alcoholics drink alcohol to fit in, to be a part of. I think people inject heroin and morphine intravenously to drop out. I think you're going to different places. Now, many of us times here, many of us get confused as to where we want to go. <laughs> so you may be both an Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's okay. Because, uh, But to function here, you must be an alcoholic. Whatever else you are, is it's like something added attraction. You know, it's just, but you must be an alcoholic. And the other problem with Demerol is that people care about where it is. I mean, it's, it, it really is amazing. They come in the emergency room in the morning to start the new shift, and they open the narcotic drawer, and all the dope is gone. And they say things like, Vince, Vince, where is the Demerol? And I'd have to say, I don't know. <laughs> That would look bad. And I'll tell you the people who care the most about missing Demerol. That is the Medical Quality Assurance Board of the state of California. They get really upset. and So upset that they came into that emergency room in the middle of the night one night and placed me under arrest for appropriating narcotics for my own use and took me right out of there and downtown to the L.A. County Jail. Right in my little green scrub suit. Downtown we went. And incidentally, that was the program for impaired physicians back in those days. We were not yet enlightened, let me tell you. They just wanted you the hell out. That's all they... And that, there, that, there I went. And uh, they, the charge was subsequently reduced to a misdemeanor, and I didn't have to go to jail. But I lost my medical license. And I ended up spending the summer of 1972 living in an apartment by the airport in Englewood. Drinking one half gallon of vodka a day. I don't have to tell you about that kind of drinking. Uh, everybody in this room knows all about that. Uh, and incidentally, if you drink a half gallon of vodka a day, that makes you an alcoholic. Uh, social drinkers do not do that. It is. They don't drink a half gallon of vodka a day. And, and that's what I did. And my wife left, and they, she took the car and the furniture. and you know, When they leave me, they take everything, let me tell you, all the time. And I was left to uh, go over. I drink by then. I'm drinking supermarket brand vodka, right? A half gallon, seven dollar a half gallon, the, the kind of the wire basket by the cash register. You know that kind of genteel. Uh, and I would take it home for cocktail hour. You know, hot vodka and the, no refrigerator. She took that, so you drink it in the middle of the living room floor, hot in August, in Englewood, California right on the approach path for the, you know, it, it just really, 
And, and I, I, all of the things that happen to you when you drink a half gallon of vodka a day happened to me that summer. I lost 35 pounds. I was in and out of blackouts. If I looked at a clock, it was, it is uh, uh, 9, 8.20. Is that a.m. or p.m.? I don't really know, and we all know about that. And I had a couple of seizures, and I was vomiting bile, and, and I would walk to the Alpha Beta market, and I would get another half gallon of vodka, and that's the way that I lived that summer. And I came out of a blackout in Newport Beach in September of 1972, sitting on a park bench by the Balboa Peninsula. Uh, the temperature was about 110, and I had on a three-piece wool suit and a white shirt and a tie. And don't ask me how I got there or why I was dressed like that. To this day, I can't tell you. But that's how I came out of a blackout. I had some luggage sitting next to me, and I knew that I was alone and I needed a job. And I got an Orange County newspaper, and I went through the ads, and I found a job as a apprentice embalmer for a mortician. It, it was a, just a hideous, you know, don't do this if you need a job. I got to tell you, it's, even if you're new, it's a terrible, this was a, you know, but my medical license was gone and I, what else could I do? So I went, I went to, this was a mortuary in Costa Mesa with a, just a dreadful, a fringe benefit, they paid $85 a week and a fringe benefit was this bachelor apartment over the room where they kept the caskets. So every morning you'd get to walk through the casket room with a hangover. You set you free, I tell you. you know, and, uh, and the mortician was a ghoul. He, you know, he was a just I, he was had a, some kind of a congenital problem, and he drug his right leg when he walked. And Christ, or like something out of a. He really did, and he didn't like me, and I didn't like him. And I got drunk and stole his hearse. And uh, on September the twentieth, nineteen seventy-two. I came out of what I hope is my last blackout, driving the wrong way on Pacific Coast Highway in Newport Beach in a stolen hearse with a young lady next to me who I did not recall meeting, oddly enough, who was screaming at the top of her lungs. And I pulled over the shoulder, and that's how, that's how I greeted the morning of September the 20th, 1972. And I remember this girl, I said to her, you know, I, 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 I have this, it occurred to me then. I have this terrible character flaw. I get, I choose these terribly neurotic women uh, because all of the women in my life end up like this. You know, they end up screaming, and I don't understand it. And I, and she had that look that all of the way. If you have a date with me, it's going to end one way, and that is I'm going to look at you, and all of your IMEC is going to be running down your face like that. You know what I mean? And the tears. I always know then the date's over. It's always quite clear. And that's the way she looked. And I knew that this, you know, I'd done it again. I found another unstable woman. And I talked to her. I said, you know, you really ought to get some counseling because you really have a lot of neuroses. That was September the 20th, 1972. I have not had a drink of alcohol, nor have I used any mood altering chemical whatsoever from that date to this. But what's more important, if you could have materialized in the back of that hearse on the shoulder of the road, going the wrong way, on Coast Highway in Newport Beach, and foretold my future, what you would have said to me would have been unbelievable. You would have said, today, you're going back to Alcoholics Anonymous. And for the next 28 plus years, you're not going to drink any alcohol and you're not going to use any drugs, and your experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is going to be completely different. And it's going to be different because for the first time in your life, the ingredient necessary for sobriety and recovery will be present inside of your soul. And I'm going to tell you what that is if you're new here tonight. And that is, a very unattractive word. It is called desperation. That is what you need to get better here. It is not love. It is not success. It is not intelligence. It is desperation. And the, your recovery here, in my opinion, is directly related to how desperate you are when you arrive and how willing you are to do things that you do not agree with and take actions and direction from people you do not like. Your, your willingness to do that 
is proportional to the amount to your chances here to get better. So if you are new here tonight, that's where you need to be, and I hope you're desperate. Others will wish you love and peace and happiness and all that other gas. I hope you're desperate. I hope your life is running out of your sleeve. I hope you're terrified, and you have nowhere else to go. And I hope you know down in your heart you're going to die tomorrow if you don't sit here and if you don't find a way to get sober. And if you're that desperate, your chances here are great. Welcome home because you're in the right place. And I carried that with me. I retired. First, I took the guy's hearse back to him. He was upset. He had been in the, apart the apartment over the casket room throwing my clothes out the window. And it was 6 o'clock in the morning, and I'm in this blacktop parking lot of this mortuary in Costa Mesa, California. All of my clothes are strewn all over there. I have no money, no job, no car, no place to live. And I don't know about you, but every time I get in that kind of shape, I go to AA. So I reported to the Costa Mesa Alano Club, which was not much, let me tell you. It was a dreadful hovel. And I, I sat at the coffee bar, and I had a cup of coffee, and they had a meeting there that noon, and I went to that meeting, and it was just awful. It was just seven Texans, you know, <laughs> out-of-work Texas plumbers sitting around a coffee table, you know, a Formica table, talking about putting the plug in the jar. I thought, oh, God, this is hideous. And then they had another meeting there that night that was perhaps worse than that. And the manager let me sleep on the sofa. The next day, I got some money together, and I rented a room in Costa Mesa for $11 a week. And I don't know if you've been to any $11 a week. They're generic. You know, they're, they're all the same. And I, I remember moving into this room thinking, I, I don't think I can. Clearly, I'll have to be here several weeks so I can get some money together and get, figure out my next move. And I don't think I can live here two weeks. Two years later, when I moved out of that room, it didn't look that bad. My perspective had changed. I spent my first two years of sobriety in Orange County. And if you would have asked me at any given moment during that two-year period, I'd say, how are you doing? I would have said, it's awful. It's, it's awful. My medical license is gone. I'm unemployable. I mean, I, 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 God, how could you be in this kind of shape if you had my opportunities, my education? You can't be here. But in reality, they were the best two years of my life. Things were happening to me that I was not aware of that were wonderful. But I didn't know it, and I only know it in retrospect. And that's something else if you're new. You'll never know anything here until after it happens. You'll only realize it after. This is the very best day of your life. But you don't know that tonight because you're sick and crazy. But you will know it. Trust me, you'll know it if you stay. And so, I, and I, I, I mean, it was, my life was awful by, on, by any standards. By looking at it, I mean, I got and lost jobs that were ridiculous. I mean, I lost a job as a gas station attendant for being incompetent. You know, really. I lost a job as a $1.87 an hour drill press operator in this ridiculous machine shop in, in, with a long row. It looked like something out of Charles Dickens. Uh, a long row of drill presses that people went to at 5.30 in the morning and they sat on a stool and pulled a handle and they put a hole in a copper plate. And then you took the copper plate and you put it over here and they wheeled up another bucket of copper plate. It was impossible. That was it. That was the job. It's impossible to do that wrong. I managed to put the hole in the wrong place in about a thousand of these copper plates one day. And the foreman, who was from outside of Dallas, <laughs> told me, he said, son, we got to let you go, boy. He said, hey, too bad. I can see you're a real trier. He said, but you're not quite bright enough to do this kind of work. And I said, and that was my, his, my big mistake. I said, bright enough, bright enough. I said, you moron, you hillbilly hick, hayseed goddamn moron. You know, I am a graduate of an Ivy League university. I went to Cornell University. He said, well, I'll tell you what, boy, you ought to go on back there and take the course in drill press operating. <laughs> and he was right. And I had a walk from that machine shop back to this $11 a week room, and it was pouring rain, and I got wet, and I had bronchitis, and I had a fever. I didn't have any medical insurance, and I knew, how does this happen? How could this happen? And I got back to the room, and some mail had caught up with me. And one, letter, one piece of mail was a letter from this physician in upstate New York inviting me to join a committee for my college class reunion. 
I thought, how do you answer that letter? I can't make it this year, Dr. Medoff. I just lost my job as a drill press operator. I mean, Jesus. The incongruity of my life. How could this possibly have happened? How could it be? And that night I went to the big meeting in Newport Beach, which was a big, uh, up, exciting speaker meeting. And the speaker that night was maybe the quintessential speaker in AA, a guy named Norm Alpey. I know a lot of you are new that you don't know who he is. I'm going to tell you about this guy. This guy was... Uh, the best way to describe him, if Frank Capra invented an AA speaker, it would be this guy. He was Mr. Everyman. And he told this wonderful story about his life and these four daughters and his redheaded wife who kept having more kids. And, and, uh, and it was a wonderful story. And, and it, was, it was genuine. And, and every, everything about this guy was genuine. And when you listen to him talk, you, 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 he said the same thing every time he talked. You, you knew it word for word. You could mouth his talk. But every time you heard it, it was as though this was the first time you heard it. And that is the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you heard that music every time that he talked. And there are, there are people like that in AA. And, uh, and I hope you get to know some of them if you're new, because it, you can hear it. It's not what they say, but it's, it's the music behind what they're saying. And I listened to Norm that night, and, and it, was, it was still depressing. I, I mean, I got I went back to this $11 week room. I had to walk back in the rain again, and I got soaking wet all over again for the second time. And I got back in this terrible room, and it was just awful. And I, I thought, what the hell is going to happen to me? I have no hope, no future. Uh, you know, I'm sober now a year and a half. What is going to happen to me? And I was so desperate that I did something so stupid. I can't believe I ever did it. I got on my knees beside the bed and said a prayer born of desperation. God, please help me. I am alone. I'm afraid. I can't make it anymore. That was my moment. That was my moment. My recovery began that night. Now, I didn't know it right away. But it began that night. Great things happened to me after that. Many bad things happened to me. But, I, but something happened that night that I didn't realize for a long time. Pretty soon my second birthday had come in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I had to get a sponsor. Now, I don't recommend you wait two years to get a sponsor if you're new. But I did that. And I, I did it because I knew who the sponsor had to be. And I did not like it. This guy was... Uh, I did not like him. He was arrogant, and he was self-serving, and he was a big speaker in Alcoholics Anonymous. And Every place he went, he had this coterie of people with him that got his coffee and saved his seat. And it was just really, really tedious. And to listen to him speak, you knew the guy was insane. I mean, he, he really, he was crazy. But there was something indisputable about him. He had this amazing capacity to help losers in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, they, the dregs of humanity would go to this man and ask him for help, and he had some facility for understanding them and communicating with them. They, we saw them. They'd leave Orange County by the busloads, it seemed, and they'd get this guy for a sponsor, and they'd join his fascist AA group on the west side of Los Angeles, and they'd do things that were apparently not at all related to anything I could understand about Alcoholics Anonymous. But they would then reappear in Orange County and their lives. Had been, I mean, amazing things. Uh, one guy I remember particularly, he was a biker. His name was Tank Top Red. You know, Jesus, was he grim. He, was a, he had a, all his teeth kicked in and his matted red beard. And he wore tank tops, rode a motorcycle, always had a pint of Canadian club in his pocket. He'd sit in the meetings and drink it in Newport Beach and dare anybody to, you know, he'd want to kill people. I mean, when you walked into a meeting and you saw red, you thought, oh, Jesus, not tonight, you know, God. And he was really, you know, the, the scourge of the, of, of the earth. And this guy dropped out of sight. We'd heard he'd got this Nazi sponsor, and uh, we didn't hear from him. And then one night I was sitting in a meeting in Newport Beach, and somebody nudged me, and they said, hey, there's red. I said, where? They said, in the back. I looked in the back, and my God, there he was, except all his dental work was done. He was clean-shaven, and he had a haircut, 
and he was dressed in gray slacks and navy blue blazer and penny loafers. And he's sitting in the back of the meeting. Somebody calls on him to come up and share, and he comes up to the podium like a gentleman, cold sober, and he says, I'm red, and I'm an alcoholic, and I haven't had a drink in eight months, and uh, I paid my, made my first child support payment last month. I was for 10 years behind or something. And next month, I'm going to vote in the presidential election. Jesus. For the Republican. Yeah. <laughs> Could really push you over the edge, I'll tell you. So I called this guy, and I asked him if he would help me. And by that time, I'd acquired some material possessions. I had a 1964 Chevrolet convertible with no brakes and a hole in the top. I used to pull that into the big, rich meetings in Newport Beach, and they'd, they'd uh, see me coming, and they'd immediately get in their Mercedes and BMWs and put them on the other side of the lot. They're always saying things to me like, do you have insurance on that car? You know, I hadn't had a driver's license in three years. Why the hell would I have insurance? You know, it's, it's ridiculous. So I'd, this guy said to come up and have lunch with him at this mission he ran on Skid Row in Los Angeles. And uh, so I drove this beat-up old Chevy to the midnight mission on Skid Row in L.A., and I had lunch with this guy, and I asked him to help me. And I'll never forget what he said. And if you were new or relatively new here tonight, I hope somebody says something like this to you. Because to me, it was the key that unlocked the door that allowed me to get better here. He said, I will help you under one condition, that you can accept the very simple proposition that your best judgment about your life is terrible and that my judgment about your life is infinitely better than yours. And if you will do everything I suggest you do without debate, I will help you. Well. I was just desperate enough that day to make that unholy pact with the devil. I agreed to do what he said. And that was 27 years ago. And he's still my sponsor today. And he had me do things that were seemingly unrelated to anything I could possibly. I mean, he said, when he told me what he wanted me to do, I just, I thought, my God, I've made a terrible mistake. You know, this guy is maybe he was a big advertising guy. So he wanted me to do things, you know, go up, get dressed in your suit, take a bus up Wilshire Boulevard and go into medical practices and ask, tell him you lost your license. You mean, I said, this is just ridiculous. It's, you know, preposterous. Uh, that's a whole other evening. I, I did do that and I got my medical license back. <laughs> Ended up going back in the very same emergency room to work that I got arrested in for stealing Demerol. Right. Worked there for the two, two and a half years following that. And I want to tell you something. During that period of time, I took these steps. One through twelve. Precisely as they're outlined in this book. And that's, and I, I and, and I'll tell you, they are exactly what they appear to be. You don't need a step consultant. Or, you know, they are precisely what they say they are. If you can read, you can recover. Read them and do them. That's all there is. There's nothing else. You can't do them wrong. They cannot be done wrong. If you're sincere, any way you do them is correct. Any way you do them. When you write that searching and fearless moral inventory, the word moral is not there by mistake. It's a moral inventory. It is not a psychological inventory designed to get you in touch with your feelings. We do not care how you feel. You know. How you feel is irrelevant here. It, it, it's about your secrets. It's about all of the terrible, ridiculous, embarrassing compromises you have made all of your life that you can't tell anybody about. Tell us about them. When you do, you're free. You get to walk in freedom. And you do not... It, it says make amends, and that means to other people, not you. You know, you don't put yourself number one on your amends list. That's all psycho babble bullshit gas. You know, I, AA is pay the money back. You owe the money. You've got to pay it back. You have to go back into your life, and you have to try to make it right. Chuck Chamberlain had the most wonderful phrase 
he used to say his whole life was dedicated. All he wanted to do was rub out the record. Rub out the record. And and that's all there is to it. And, and that's what happened to me. And I've had a wonderful life. I got to tell you, boy, great thing. I made mistakes. Marvin's going to laugh at this one because he remembers it well. In 1976, I met this cute little redhead. I met her in September, got married in October, and divorced in November. Now, that is a mistake. And the last time I saw her, she was on the way back to her daddy's ranch in El Dorado, Texas. You know. <laughs> but I'll tell you what else. I met another woman right after that or shortly after that who got sober in 1975. And she got sober while nursing her husband who was dying of lung cancer. And that's not an easy task, I will tell you. And he passed away, and we started to see each other, and we fell in love, and we got married, and we will be married 21 years in September. And that can't happen to me. Girls, you don't stay married to me for 21 years, i got to tell you. Uh, it, 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 as far as my family can track back, there have been four divorces in the history of our family. Three of them are mine. So, <laughs> that are to tell you, but I'm married to this woman for 21 years, and I'm going to tell you without embarrassment, I love her more with every breath I take. I love my wife, and I love my marriage, and there's nobody else's marriage I would rather have. And that's a great thing to be able to say after 21 years of marriage. It's a wonderful gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. I have grown up in this fellowship and in this marriage. I've learned how to be a man. I've learned what being a man really is all about. And if you're new and young and male, I can help you with some things tonight that can save you years of untold grief. One is a, this, a, a listen to this, and you will. Women are not the enemy. They are your loving equal partners. Your wife is to be cherished, and you walk this way together in an equal partnership. She is not your prisoner. She is not your hostage. She is not your servant. She is, if you're lucky, your equal partner. You should love her and you should cherish her. Manhood is not macho posturing. Manhood is fidelity, paying your bills, going to work, and loving your family. That's the gift that Alcoholics Anonymous has given to me. And if you're new, I hope that you receive the same gift. Thank you for having me in Las Vegas. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.